We've looked all the way back to 91, you know, to be honest. Um, but the landscape has changed a lot uh, over that time, uh, even though actually the, st the structures haven't changed massively, not since 99. Um, but I think, you know, the way the IRB has gone, which is trying to put, even though we do have matches in Cardiff, but trying to put these tournaments in one country, so trying to create that focus in one place, um, is actually a, a, a game changer, because 99 was, you know, matches everywhere, matches in France, matches in Ireland, matches in Scotland, Wales, England. Um, so you kind of, it's quite hard to create that momentum within a country. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing that, that, that we want to take out of it is that we can learn from, from anyone. Um, you know, one of our big things at the moment is really going around and saying, you know, let's look at the NFL as an example. I mean, really, really clever what they're doing, building over time, interest in the sport, and then look at their spectator experience, for example, shutting Regent Street on a Saturday, on a shopping day. Who would have thought of doing that two years ago? You know, how do we look at that and think, what's the rugby equivalent of that? What's our World Cup equivalent of that? Uh, or, you know, how does uh, St. James's Park work for a normal football match? But how can we actually tweak it slightly and make that experience where somebody walks in and goes, wow, I've been coming to St. James's Park for 20 years, but that's great. You've done that, you've changed that. So I think it's more, we have to learn from what went on before. Um, and the IRB is very good. They've got what's called a knowledge center. So you can look at past World Cups and see what they've done. Um, but also I think we need to look at what everybody else is doing, but plow our own furrow at the same time. That actually comes back to the complications of, of the structure. That's an IRB brand. We have no input into that brand. Uh, we have no input into how the website looks. Um, you know, there is a, uh, you know, if there's going to be an app made, you know, it's actually that right is owned by the IRB. So it's part of what we're trying to do to try and, you know, almost like infiltrate those discussions and say this is where we think it needs to be as people on the ground. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you want to grab the younger people, you need to rebrand it a little bit. Yeah. I, I don't disagree. I think what you'll see from sort of England 2015 perspective is the way that we are bringing in you know, much more colour, um, you know, the way we'll do um, the venues themselves, for example. You know, there'll be a certain colour for a certain part, whether it's, you know, media will be some, such and such a colour, spectator walkways will be another colour. Um, so, yeah, the, the branding side of it's really important, but that's where the historical nature of certainly this tournament, uh, because it sits with, with the IRB, those decisions, we, we don't have a huge amount to say about that. But no, that's fine. But I should also add that actually the RB is looking at this structure, um, if not for 2019, because Japan's already the host, but 2023 about whether you do tweak it uh, and actually more that Rugby World Cup Limited and, and the local organising committee is somehow closer together or, or even one, one body. But yeah, it's a great question and a great challenge. Yeah, it's certainly a brand that we, that we, we will use, but again, uh, commercialise it in the sense that we actually don't have any commercial rights. We, we, even, even a national, or even a supplier, for example, they're not a supplier to England 2015, they're a supplier to the IRB and Rugby World Cup. Um, but something that we are looking at is actually what is our um, almost like consumer facing brand uh, and w w whether we go to something you know, much more like, because at the moment we are, England Rugby 2015, part of the Rugby World Cup. That's effectively what our consumer facing brand is. But we're, we're just gonna go England 2015, like London 2012, you know, keep it short, keep it simple. But, you know, we actually, it, it's not actually about our brand. Unfortunately, it's about, it's about the World Cup brand. This is actually gonna be, the, and it's one of my jobs, it's the, fir it's the first Rugby World Cup where there'll be a fan zone in every host city. Uh, it's, it's part of the contractual arrangement that we have with each host city. We are actually a, a different organising committee structure to New Zealand, for example, because New Zealand had 50% government funding. Well, actually, the 50% that was the loss was taken by the New Zealand government. Uh, and the other half was the NZRFU. Um, whereas we're obviously a more independent business cutting a deal with each of these host cities and in their contract, they have to supply a fan zone. So on the Olympic Park uh, for the matches here, there'll be a fan zone. Uh, in Stratford, Newham, somewhere else, there'll be another fan, there'll be a fan zone probably as well. Um, you know, in Richmond, in Brent, for the, for the Wembley games, and Newcastle and Exeter and everywhere else, 
We've also got to develop a central London strategy. Um, it's very, very hard to get spaces for extended periods of time. Um, but we're really looking at that sort of central London exclamation point at the end of the tournament. What is that? That's a great point. And, and one of the, the, the vision for the whole tournament is really to celebrate rugby and celebrate those values. Um, but you still actually have to tell people that. A lot of people don't know that rugby is, a not, is unsegregated. Uh, so, you know, when we go to, so you have a conversation with, with police forces and say we're going to have a fan zone in X. You know, fan zones for them equals uh, Glasgow Rangers against whoever it was in Manchester. Yeah. And, 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 yeah, and, you know, you actually have to do a lot of that. And that's a lot of what we've been doing this year is going out and educating all these stakeholders and saying this is not the same. People will be in the stadium together. People will congregate before, during and after the game together. And that's also where I think fan zones, fan parks will play a massive part of the tournament as it moves forward over what is a pretty extended period. It's a six week tournament. It's not two weeks like, like the Olympics. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's very complex. There's no, no doubt about that. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, Leicester Tigers, particularly sort of 18 months ago, you know, the position they were, they were saying was, was quite, I don't want to use the word extreme, but they had very strident views about, about the fact that Welford Road should have, been a, uh, should have been a venue. But I think, you know, what, what's happened since then, um, you know, is, is the fact that our CEO, Debbie Jevons, who's, who's ex locog you know, going round to all of the premiership clubs, meeting with all the CEOs and the chairman, you know, trying to work out how we can work together for the benefit of everyone and plainly, you know, clubs and authority, whether whatever sport you're in, there's always conflict. I mean, you know, Richard Cockrell got banned, I think, for nine matches at the start of the season. So, uh, you know, Leicester Tigers and the RFU, that was not a great relationship at, at that point. Yeah, um, at the end of the day, everybody needs each other in lots of ways. If you, you know, the whole stuff about the European situation at the moment, what's going to come out of that? Um, you know, everybody's actually interlinked. And that's ultimately where, you know, RFU just announced its accounts for, uh, for last year. Uh, you know, they're an incredibly successful business, mate, making good revenues. Um, but I think it ultimately it just, it means, if you look at the council as an example, you know, they need each other. The council needs the Tigers because it's a great brand and it puts the city on the map. But actually the Tigers need the council as well because they need planning and they need licensing and they need assistance with policing and all those other things. So, you know, it's, it, it's that partnership approach that we're trying to bring, um, which may be slightly different from the Olympics because the Olympics had such a huge uh, group of, you know, three and a half thousand people working for local, whatever it was by games time, we're 200 people maximum by tournament time. So you actually need all those different groups of people if you're going to create, you know, what we hope the tournament to be. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different ways that that's looking at big. So if you take our volunteer program, for example, which again, not on the scale of the Olympics, nowhere near, uh, somewhere around the six to 8,000 people, uh, but 75% of those will come from rugby clubs. Uh, they'll be nominated by clubs, depending on whether you're a voting member or not of the RFU, different, different numbers. Uh, so that's one thing. We're also looking into what we're currently calling working title sort of festival of rugby. Um, almost like creating a brand, a bit like the Inspire Mark, but slightly different. Uh, so that, you know, if clubs want to put on something during the Rugby World Cup, badge it, Festival of Rugby, try and get away from a lot of the commercial restrictions you'll have, if you call it, a, which you wouldn't be able to call it a Rugby World Cup fan zone, uh, stuff like that. So there's a lot of that stuff going on. I think what a lot of the things that the RFU is doing uh, is, is really, really important in terms of how working with those clubs on you know, getting more referees, getting more coaches, uh, you know, the sort of 2015 referees by 2015 that they're saying. Uh, so there's lots of different ways that can be accessed, but it's just going to have to be, um, you know, more cleverly thought of because of the commercial restrictions if you try and do something uh, official. But as I say, through volunteering and, and lots of other things, ticketing is another one. Um, you know, obviously at the moment, the way tickets are sold to England internationals is effectively through clubs. Um, but we, again, as England Rugby 2015, we don't own the ticketing process. 
So if we're going to do something like that with the clubs, we have to go through all that structure up to the IRB in Dublin. And they're really worried about if you sell tickets to clubs that they just collate them all and sell them as hospitality, which is in contravention to this bit up here on the right. So it's really, really complex about something that should be quite simple. Just want some people at rugby clubs to buy some tickets. It's actually massively complicated. Yeah, 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 and that's, I mean, that's, that's part of it. Um, you know, but if you look at, um, so Rugby League World Cup, it's happening at the moment. That is a joint England and Wales tournament. Um, but this is, even though there are games in Cardiff, you know, that was an arrangement made between the WRU, Welsh Rugby Union, uh, and the RFU, um, that those matches would be held in Cardiff, but it is, you know, billed as an England tournament. So at the moment we're about 50, 60 people. Uh, I joined in, uh, in March after I'd left, uh, left Cadbury when there were 20 people. Uh, so we've already more than doubled in size. We'll double again by January next year. Um, but 2013 is really a planning year. So it's, it's working with the venues that we were talking about earlier. What are they actually going to look like at tournament time? What's the city going to look like? How are they going to activate sponsors in and around the city at that point? Because um, we're really like the, I guess, the operational driving force. We're about what's going to happen on the ground, whether that's in a venue, uh, whether that's actually a transport hub, We've set up what's called the National Transport Coordination Group um, because unfortunately for the Rugby League World Cup, on the first weekend where they had the matches in uh, Cardiff, Network Rail had shut the main uh, tunnel between London and Cardiff at Bristol because they make their plans two years in advance. So it's really getting in front of those people. You know, planning something the Olympics did brilliantly with uh, telling people to avoid certain places at certain times. Uh, it's that sort of planning uh, at the moment and then next year really going into s starting how are we going to launch the volunteer program how are we going to sell tickets you know then getting further and further deeper and deeper into the operational planning of each venue so almost like what they call block plans at the moment so if you look at Twickenham and there's a big block that says right that's going to be spectator experience and a big block that says that's going to be hospitality so in the next six months we've actually got to go into each of those blocks and make those detail uh, and then engage as we go into 2015 with those venues and those t venue teams because we're coming with maybe 10 people to each venue, not the 350 that Locog sent to these places. So actually you need all that local knowledge and experience and you need them to say, you know, don't set your media centre up like that because that exit then blocks these spectators coming this way that we would never know. So we really, really, uh, we really need all those local minds to help us. Um, but we'll be about 220, I think, by uh, tournament time. So not a huge amount of people. And, and your role, the um, what is it? Uh, head of city delivery, uh, of, is there a head of city delivery for each city, or are you kind of overseeing? Just yeah. curious to kind of yeah, yeah. how yeah. the City delivery is a kind of weird title, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't decide it myself. Um, but yeah, so. So I'm kind of head of city delivery, and then I've got two city delivery managers, uh, and we'll cluster the 13 venues, seven for one and six for another. And underneath that, uh, we'll have two, two more people. So we're only, at tournament time, seven people in city delivery, uh, which shows you the scale of what we're trying to do with fan zones, city dressing, we're, we're transport responsible for, uh, rights protection, ambush marketing, you know, it's a huge, huge scale and a huge challenge. Um, but that's why we need contracts with all the host cities, contracts with all the host venues. Um, but great job. I'm, I'm not complaining. Yeah, that's a great question, particularly, uh, you know, here in and around Newham. Uh, it's definitely something that is on, is on the radar, that we will create a process by which each host city can purchase an amount of tickets uh, to then use as they, apart from packaging it up and selling it as hospitality, uh, use it as they see fit for local community, local residents, for rewarding volunteers, uh, that sort of stuff. It is a key part of what we're trying to do with ticketing. Um, but as I say, everything that we do has to be up and approved by IRB. Um, and we're actually work trying to find a ticketing partner at the moment, um, you know, like a StubHub type of company. Uh, so when that's finalised, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. But it should be the ability of each host city to purchase some tickets to then 
use as they want on a community basis. Um, I, I really hope that we're, we're able to deliver you know, 13 or 14, if you include central London, uh, iconic city centre, brilliant photo backdrop fan zones that can really be a central point for the tournament. Uh, you know, I'd love to look at a picture, you know, a picture of all of them and see the Tyne Bridge in the background in Newcastle or the pier in Brighton, you know, those sort of images uh, with some sort of exclamation point over central London on the final weekend. Uh, really because if those fan zones are a success, we've gone such a long way into spreading the tournament wider than its natural habitat. Because, you know, even if you think of uh, Twickenham, 10 matches, you know, 80,000 people, that's 800,000 people going through the stadium. But if you have a fan zone that's open for six weeks and shows every single match, you could actually put more people through a fan zone than will go to Twickenham. And if you've done that, or got even close to that, you've actually reached that goal of making England a rugby country in 2015. And that's where I'll be retiring, off to the Bahamas. You're going to do that because Heineken are very good at uh, holding the Heineken house and things like yep. that. Yep. Selling beer and beer is synonymous with rugby. <laughs> so I was looking for a new lecturer in marketing. I just want to say two things before uh, clapping uh, for your presentation. First of all, uh, today uh, our partner became an official partner of UEFA, so for people that uh, wants to uh, congratulate with uh, Global Sport Job for the great job that they did uh, uh, today and they will do also in the future. For me, it's a good thing to say that I'm happy that uh, one of our partners became uh, recognized by important uh, association. The last uh, great achievement was that you were able to say to my student that studying sport policy and studying the, sport, the structure of sport in England is important. Yes. Because every time I, I teach sport policy, they look at me, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have to study this? And you said to them, there you, you need go. to learn everything. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much again. Thank uh, you.